You're listening to Interactive Wrestling Radio, featuring the interactive interview, courtesy of WrestlingEpicenter.com. Welcome back to Interactive Wrestling Radio. Joining us on the Newsmaker line is a WWE Hall of Famer and a true legend, the original man who won the Intercontinental Championship. I, of course, am speaking of Ken Patera. Are you with me, sir? Yes, I am. How are you doing today, James? I'm doing great. It's a pleasure to have you on. I've been doing this for 20 years, and I've never had you on, so it's such an honor to finally cross paths with you. God, I said, is that guy black blackballing me or what? <laughs> well, the reason... Yeah, the reason we're having you on is that your book is out, The Weight of the World, through our good friend at Walking on Hot Waffles, Kenny Casanova. What made now the right time to put pen to paper and do this book? Well, I'm uh, almost 80 years old, that's one. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's figure, figure out the timeline. You know, hey. I, I've had uh, friends... Uh, bitch and complain to me for 40 years now. I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> so put pen to paper and uh, compose a book of some sort. Mm. So I said, I, I, I've been retired for a few years now. And <clears throat> instead of sitting around the house and drinking all day, uh, I, I decided to write a book. So I quit drinking. Yeah, worst thing I ever did. Is that right? Oh God, well, I've, I've I've been a drunk my whole life, you know. Mm. So, uh, but that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing, because I wasn't out of control. I was always in, in uh, control of my faculties, and you know, ne 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 never bothered anybody, never hurt anybody. Huh. So, I was a good drunk, <laughs> and that's the you know I, I've thumbed through the book. I've got a copy of it right next to me here, and man, it's it's a good read, and I am enjoying reading about this and 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 reading about you and finding out new things that I never knew before. Um, and of course, our good buddy, like I mentioned, Kenny Casanova, is the one that kind of put it all together. Um, how is it working with Kenny? Well, good. I'm not making any sales, though. How do you mean? Uh, huh? How do you mean by that? Well, he takes all the money. Oh, is that true? You know, what the What the fuck is that about? <laughs> yeah, but uh, no, I I uh, I created a website. It's called. It, 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 get this. This is a, this is an original. Mm -hmm. KenPatera.com. Oh, wow. How'd you think of that one? Oh, it, it, well, I really did. My daughter thought of it. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, oh. KenPatera.com. If, if people want uh, autographed uh, books. And uh, I thing is, I can personalize them. You know, I'm, I'm a long way from uh, New York. I, I live in northern Minnesota. That's right, yeah. So, yeah, so uh, people want these. Uh, uh, actually, I, I've been doing real good on the book sales. I'm, uh, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. but It is, uh, it is a great read, and uh, Ric Flair wrote the foreword to the book. Um, how I, Obviously, you know, you guys train together. I mean, you guys go way, way, way back. Um, was he the perfect fit to write the foreword? Yeah, Rick and I lived together for over a year. Oh, wow. Uh, prior to uh, starting Vern Gagne's uh, training camp uh, there in Minneapolis. A lot, a lot of people don't realize that was a very, very famous uh, training camp. Uh, because... <laughs> Everybody that came out of there came, wound up being a main eventer somewhere. That's right. Uh, I remember it was yourself. Yeah. It was Ric Flair yeah. and uh, Iron Rick Sheik. Mm -hmm. Iron Sheik. His real name's Kazro Vasuri. He's actually from Iran. Yes, sir. A lot of people 
think that he was uh, a make-believe uh, Arab uh, selling uh, whatever on the corner of Fifth Avenue in New York City. Huh. Uh, but uh, he's actually uh, a sweetheart of a guy. I really liked uh, Cosro. But anyway, it was uh, the Iron Sheik, Ric Flair, myself, Jumpin' Jimmy Brunzel, uh, Greg Gagne, uh, Vern Gagne's son. Right, right. And, and a friend of Wahoo McDaniel, uh, Bob Bruggers. Uh, Bob, Bob grew up in the uh, western Minnesota end of it. And from a little town, he was all state in four different sports. Can you believe that? Wow. How do you do that in four different sports? A football, <laughs> basketball, baseball, and track and field. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, he was uh, he was a big kid in high school. He was like 6'2", six, 6'3", six, and weighed 225 pounds in high school. Got to give you some reference there, I was 5'10", weighed 190 pounds my wow. senior year. So, wow. So he, he he was a but once in a lifetime somebody like that comes along and just dominates. Well, when he got to college, things uh, uh, turned around a little bit. I think he still was uh, all American football player at the University of Minnesota for two or three years, <clears throat> and then he went and wound up being Wahoo McDaniel's teammate for the Miami Dolphins. There you wow okay. Yeah. So anyway, next question. All right. <laughs> well, um, I was I was going to say that there's some of the stuff that I did not know about you in the book, and like I told you before, I've been a fan for many a year, was the stuff about Munich, the stuff about uh, the Olympics in Munich, and the fact that you know obviously that's become part of of history of what happened in Munich and all that. Uh, what was it like being there when? you know, world-changing events took place at those Olympics? Well, it was crazy. Uh, it happened September 5th, 1972, mm -hmm. the day I was supposed to compete. And uh, so uh, it was it, it was a nutso uh, time. So anyway, I take the bus over to the training hall, get weighed in, and uh, whatnot. <clears throat> and uh, now that happened at uh, about five in the morning. Mm -hmm. Wow. They still made us go way in. Yeah, what the fuck? <laughs> it, 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 while we were on the bus to the training hall to get weighed in, they canceled the Olympics because of the terrorists shooting up the Jews mm -hmm. uh, there in the Olympic village. And uh, I, I could see the, I, uh, I looked out my window of my uh, uh, condo over there in the Olympic Village, and sure enough, there they were, the terrorists, I don't know, half a dozen of them running around the balcony of the Jewish complex, mm -hmm. uh, you know, firing their AK-47s and whatnot. And, uh, you know, the thing that kind of disturbs me is that about a week before that actually happened, mm -hmm. the German police and German security had a cement intelligence given to them <clears throat> that Yasser Arafat and... Uh, the P was, yeah, PLO, right. planning some kind of an attack on the Olympic Village. So they actually stepped up security. Well, the Jewish delegation was pissed off saying, you guys are acting like Gestapo's. We don't need all this security. Well, uh, the German police kept it up. And even with their extra effort, uh, the terrorists still got over the fence. Wow. Uh, yeah. 
and they, they got over the back fence there where there was no lighting. And uh, I don't know why there wasn't any lighting. Maybe they knocked the lights out. Who knows? Mm. But anyway, they came in the back uh, of the uh, compound that the Jewish team was staying at and uh, shot them up. Yeah. Oh my God! It didn't take the it didn't take the security very long to get there. They came in on two or three helicopters, half track uh, tanks, and about twelve hundred. Uh, that's what I heard. I they came in with twelve hundred uh, uh, forces, and uh, but it was already over by then. But you know they captured the. Uh, uh, compound, and then the, the terrorists, they were holding, I think, uh, half a dozen athletes and a couple coaches as uh, uh, um, hostages. As hostages. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, boy. And so, anyway, they were making all kinds of demands to the German police. We, we want this, we want that. So they got two helicopters to fly the terrorists to the airport. Mm -hmm. Well, the German police stationed uh, snipers all around uh, uh, the area where the plane was. And when those terrorists uh, got out of the helicopter, the snipers started dropping them. Oh, but the, well, one terrorist had two incinerated uh, grenades, incendiary grenades, and he lobbed those into the helicopters and blew it up. Of course, all the Jewish guys that were inside those helicopters got fried. And uh, so then it's over, and the next morning uh, uh, they announced that the Olympics will continue at noon. Awesome! So you get yeah, so, you yeah, got the so chance anyway. to compete yeah, after all. Yeah, that's awesome. All right. Well, uh, I guess my question and my next question is going to be about going from that world, but weightlifting and and, and strongman and being that transition into professional wrestling is, is it maybe more less so than than today where a lot of the guys were really tough guys back then and seems like we might have softened up a little bit now but was it a hard transition to go from from that world to the professional wrestling world no no because i had i had started watching wrestling on uh, tv when i was 10 years old uh. And uh, that's when uh, Portland Wrestling. Yep. I grew up in Portland, Oregon. Yep. That's Don Owen Portland started. Don Owens was a promoter. And yep. He had all the wrestlers in. He had a brand new TV station, and uh, came on like uh, nine o'clock, ten no ten o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't remember if Portland Rough House or Portland All Star, something like that. I think it was All Star, all but I could be professional wrong. Professional wrestling and all us kids loved it. Yeah. After about three weeks of watching that, all the furniture in my parents' house is broke. <laughs> the dining room, there's the couches, the coffee tables, everything was fucked up, broke. But the TV didn't have a scratch on it. <laughs> Very cool. Well, I, I, when I first started doing interviews, one of my first interviews, one of the first 20 interviews was with the late Bruno Sammartino. And I remember when I said to my aunt, who's no longer with us, oh, I'm going to have Bruno Sammartino on today. And she was amazed because, of course, I grew up in the Northeast. So that was like, you know, his that's his zone. Um what was it like to, to main event Madison Square Garden against the living legend as he was, Bruno Sammartino? 
Well, that was always my goal, you know. Uh, I started wrestling uh, in the AWA in 1973. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when I got to New York, it was 76. October 76, I believe it was. So I did TV for three months. Uh, you know, get all the hype and everything going. And my first match was uh, my first match with Bruno was at Madison Square Garden. I think it was January 17th, 19, uh, 1977. Sounds about right. Yes. Yeah. And I gave him like a redheaded stepchild. <laughs> I had him on his hands and knees begging for mercy. Please, Mr. Patera, please, Mr. Patera, don't hurt me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, uh, you, that's not the only time you challenged for the WWF title. In fact, I was looking it over and you challenged Bob Backlund in the match of the year uh, in 1980. And then the, of course, the PWI, of course, match of the year. And later on, Hulk Hogan. Um, let's just stick to Bob Backlund, though. Uh, what was the differences between working with such a large man and, and a bodybuilder type like Bruno and then working with the All-American boy as he was, uh, Bob Backlund? Well, uh, Bobby was more of a scientific type of wrestler, as uh, they used to call it. And Bruno, but Bruno could do all that stuff. Bruno could do the arm drags and the drop kicks and the, uh, you know, wrestling holds and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And of course, when I broke in the business, that for three months all we did was learn the basics, you know, beals, uh, monkey flips, uh, uh, arm drags. Uh, Drop toe hold, yeah. Drop toe holds. And, I mean, we we learned the whole thing. And uh, so, when we started wrestling professionally, mm -hmm. after three months of training camp, yeah, we 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 knew what to expect. And uh, well, the guy that trained us was uh, Vern Gagne, and. Uh, he, you know, a lot of people don't realize this, but in amateur wrestling, the the amateur wrestling Hall of Fame voted Vern Gagne the number one wrestler of the first fifty years wow. in amateur wrestling. Yeah, so I mean, he was uh, he was very well thought of, and uh, so he he coached us. Then he had a guy in from Manchester, England, by the name of Billy Robinson. Yeah. Yeah. And Billy probably, he coached us like three, four days a week and for three months. But we, we were in training camp six days a week. And uh, it was brutal. You know, people say, well, how tough was that training camp of Vern Gagne? I said... It was as tough as any training camp you can imagine. Much tougher than professional football. Oh, no, no way. I said, hey, asshole. I brought in three friends of mine at different times that had played for the uh, Minnesota Vikings. And they were thinking about transitioning into uh, pro wrestling. You know what happened to all three of them? What happened? They didn't make it. Oh, man. They weren't tough enough. <laughs> they weren't tough enough. It was too hard. And I was taking it easy on them. I mean, <laughs> my God. Uh, I'm not, I'll never forget the, the one big guy, 6'5", 300 pounds. He was the long snapper and played on special teams for mm -hmm. the Minnesota Vikings. <laughs> Wow. Uh, but Mike Morris, who to this day is a very dear friend of mine. But, uh, uh, you know, here's the guy that could bench press 550 pounds and, you know, do it all. A tremendous athlete. And uh, 
he quit after the first day. Wow. That's <laughs> <insane. laughs> he said, and I don't think I'm going to be able to do this. And uh, I said, well, when you come back tomorrow, we'll go through it. He called me on the phone the next day and says, Ken, I'm so sore I can't even get out of bed. <laughs> <laughs> you broke him. <laughs> yeah, I said, Mike, hell, we took it easy on you. Didn't yeah. you? I said, yes. And he says, well, I, I don't think I can do it. So, anyway. All right. So you, I, I listened to a lot of your interviews in the preparation for this, as well as reading the book, and you refer to here a lot. And here is Minnesota, which everybody that's a wrestling fan, when they hear Minnesota, their first thought is the AWA logo, because Minnesota, AWA go together. Um, when you were there, in the 80s, and Vince McMahon raided the AWA. He took so many of the key components. Uh, from you looking at it, as, as somebody who was in that locker room, could you see what Vince was doing and that he was kind of taking all of the key parts of all the territories and kind of building this one ultimate company that, like he was with the WWF? I knew what he was doing. I, 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 I was in... Uh... Uh, New York wrestling Bruno Sammartino, mm -hmm. and a couple of years later wrestling Bobby Backlund, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Hulk uh, had started uh, New Year's Day 1980. I'll never forget it. Uh, Allentown uh, Fairgrounds, and uh, here's this big blonde-haired guy, you know, and. Uh, I said, how long have you been wrestling? He said, well, I started in Florida. I grew up in Florida. Then I went to uh, Mid-South, and I think he went to uh, Rocky Mountain Wrestling. So he had been in the business for about a year at that time, maybe, maybe not even a year. And mm -hmm. then uh, he got a, a break to come to New York. And... Uh, so I, I, I knew Hulk pretty well. And uh, I, I watched his match. I think he wrestled Bobby Backlund a couple times. The matches were just horrible. Horrible. <laughs> were they really? God, I said, where did this fucking bum come from? <laughs> and uh, so then, uh, but he was green. He was, just, he was still learning the business and then he started to get it you know he started to catch on to uh, what uh, the process was mm -hmm. you know everything you do in life doesn't matter if you're selling cars or building skyscrapers or you're a brain surgeon or what whatever there's a process yep. and if you don't follow the process you don't make it. You That's might right. as well go somewhere else and do something else. But there's a process. So everybody that understands this, not, not everybody that hears this is going to understand it. Mm -hmm. But those that get it and uh, follow the process, they become very, very successful. And that's what life is all about. You know, you don't just go off doing harebrained, stupid things because then, you know, you just turn out to be a dumb fuck. <laughs> you know, and, that, that, and you'll never amount to shit. And I, and I tell people, that especially young guys, you know, I'm 80 years old, you know, but, but I love giving advice to young guys that have potential. If I see somebody that doesn't have any potential, fuck them. You know, I, I won't even <laughs> waste my time. No, seriously, I won't waste my time on. But, I believe you. That I see potential in, and, and they come to me and ask me uh, uh, what, what, what they should do or ask me for advice. And it, if, if I can give them advice, uh, which is 99% of the time, yeah, you know, for, for once in a while, I you know I I don't know what to tell them. I'll tell them to ask somebody else. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, that that's what life is about. 
you know, helping others and help them get off on the right foot and to follow the process of whatever they're going to do in life. Absolutely. Um, so I get my next question was going to be about the WWF merchandising machine. Once you joined up over there, you know, to this day, if I type in Ken Patera, one of the first things I see is the, uh, the rubber action figure that they did of you, the LJN action figure. And all that merchandising was just so global. And, you know, you talked about when you were 10 and being a wrestling fan for somebody like me who, you know, was 10 at that time. Uh, you yeah. know, that's the things we think about is that they they had lunch boxes and they had action figures and all that stuff. W- was what? it surprising to see what they what they were able to put together for the wrestling in terms of merchandise? Yeah, uh, what didn't they have? They had everything. <laughs> they had all the bases covered. Yeah. yeah, but you were one of the first videotapes as well, one of the Coliseum videos they did on you too. Yeah, I think I well. Yeah, I, I was there on the ground floor, you know. And, yeah, the Ken Patera story, wasn't it? Yeah, that's what they called it. Yep, that's right. Yeah. Now, people say, well, how much is that is true, Ken? I said, none of it. None of it? Wow. I said, I didn't have anything to do with that. Vince McMahon wrote the whole fucking thing. <laughs> when uh, when Gene Okerlund and I were, we were doing... I don't know, two or three different interviews or promos for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Gene would always hand me a script. I said, who's writing this bullshit, Vince? He <laughs> said, yeah, Vince McMahon, it's all coming out of his brain. I said, yeah. I, I said, I don't talk like this. I'm not supposed to, you know, he had me acting like a fucking a orangutan or something, you know. But yeah, it just wasn't me. I didn't feel comfortable doing it, mm. and because I had no control over it. But you know, I was just coming back, and yeah, you know, I, I I really didn't have any say. So, absolutely. Anyway. Somebody you crossed paths with, perhaps more than anybody else in your time in wrestling, was the man that everybody has a story about, Andre the Giant. Um, I got to ask you, I, I'm sure there's a billion of them, but do you have any good Andre stories you could share? Well, you know, I wrestled Andre 600 times plus. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay, how in the fuck can that be? I said, well, easy. I said, uh, I wrestled the guy in singles, tag teams, six man tags, eight man tags. I wrestled him in every fucking battle royal in the country, damn near, you know, <laughs> the territories that I was in. And um, the, um, um, it's like, I'll give you an example. Here in the AWA in mm-hmm. Minneapolis, uh, yep. Vern Gagne would have battle royal season every October. So there, there's uh, 30 battle royals right there. And Andre and I were basically the last two in the ring. And uh, so, uh, of course, he always threw me out. <laughs> but a lot of times we'd have a like a three, four, five-minute match before uh, he got to me and threw me out, you know, over, over the top rope. And awesome. so, you know... But when I was in Texas, when I was in uh, Georgia, when I was in uh, 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 Mid-Atlantic uh, with Jim Crockett Promotions, uh, WWF. Um, and so anyway, I'm going to wander off here. But anyway, yeah, 600 times. That's amazing. And, uh, you know how I know that? How? Well... I was in Hartford, Connecticut, getting ready for a match. And Andre there, uh, and uh, Roddy Piper was there. Um, you, know, a bunch of, you know, there were about 25 of us anyway. So here comes this rookie in the locker room. Uh, he just got out of somebody's training camp. 
and they picked him up to give him a dark match. And uh, so uh, he sits down next to me. I'm so and so. You're you're Ken Patera. I said yes, I am. Well, I'm so and so. I'm just this is my first match uh, tonight. And he was all giggly and everything. You know, he could hardly wait. Uh, to, and then he sees Andre across the locker room. He Scott, you ever wrestled that big guy? Mm. I said, yeah, a few times. Oh, well, how many times did you wrestle him? I said, probably 300. And mm. Andre heard me. And uh, he was playing cribbage with Arnie Skolman. And Andre heard me tell this kid about 300. And he said, he, so he looks up and looks over to me. He said, no, no boss. More like 600 times. Wow. And I said, what? He said, yeah. He said, we did the singles, the four man tag team, six man, the eight man tag teams. Shit, we did over 200 battle royals. And uh, I says, yeah, Christ, you know, when, when you add all that shit up, it is. It's over 600 times. That's amazing. And, uh, yeah, the kid's sitting there with his mouth open. Couldn't believe it. Hmm. I said, well, that answers your question, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> Who'd the kid go on to be? Do we do we know who the kid ended up being? No, he he just brought in to do a squash job for somebody. Ah, okay. All right. So uh, I I watched an interview you did where <laughs> you didn't want to talk about this next subject, so I'm going to gloss over it. That's of course the 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 arrest, the McDonald's stuff, all that stuff, and we're not going to talk about that. The interview is too short to get into that. Read the book. <laughs> I will. I, that's another good plug. That's a great plug because one of the things I talked to about Kenny is I said, and just to be sure, the that stuff is in the book because you don't love to talk about it. So that is a, a good selling point for the book. Get the book and you can find out all you need to know about that situation. The best place to buy it is KenPatera.com. KenPatera.com. Well, when you got out, when you got out, you know, I know you, you did a gym and all that, but was there an itch? Because wrestling started to get, it it, it almost died because Vince had the whole situation with you know, yeah. the steroids and all that. Vince started to suffer a little bit. But in the late 90s, wrestling really caught on again. And it was as big, if not bigger, than the the 80s when, when everybody was, was making huge money. Did you ever get the itch to get back in the ring? No. No? No. I had a very successful business. Uh running my uh, um, health club, and uh, I had a limousine service. I had a sports, uh, sports nutrition business, you know, with all the vitamins and protein powders and stuff and uh, uh, sports apparel. I had my finger in about five or six different very successful businesses. Mm. And uh, so, no, I had – I was still uh, – uh, wrestling uh, in the 90s, uh, but you know, I I went to Bremen, Germany for Otto Vance, and I went down to uh, Singapore for uh, Mark Lewin. Wow! And uh, then uh, Bam Bam Bigelow got got a group together, and I was one of them. We went to Moscow, Russia. So you know, we were I was still bouncing around. But and there was no desire to, to do like WCW or WWE or WWF no. as it still was. No? Okay. No, because I had my businesses to run. Yeah. Yeah, wrestling is fucking every day. <laughs> every day you have to be somewhere. You know, uh, you have to uh, listen to where they want to, you know, you don't get paid unless you do what they tell you. Very cool. Well. And then, uh, um, uh, 98, end of 98, I had sold all my businesses. And so, uh, I was freelancing a little bit, running some 
independent wrestling shows. Mm -hmm. And so I decided, hell, I'll open up a wrestling uh, school. Well, shit, I couldn't believe the response. The first month I had like 60 guys wow. signed up, $3,500 a piece. And I, I had two or three trainers. And uh, yeah, so we were, and I, I, I had a lot of uh, gym equipment left over, like, uh, you know, treadmills, stairmasters, uh, barbells, dumbbells. And so uh, I put those in uh, my uh, my wrestling camp, and uh, so yeah, it was uh, it was really good. I, I did that wrestling camp uh, for three years, and uh, by that time, uh, Vince had fucking destroyed wrestling. <laughs> you must be reading my <laughs> questions. <laughs> Yeah, he fucking destroyed it. Yeah, I, 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 I was booking casinos and colleges, and high schools, um, all, all kinds of you know uh, venues. Even a, I promoted like three, or, three or four matches for church organizations. Yeah. Wow. Believe that. And those Absolutely. Were big crowds. Yeah, you know, I've been to a few of those. Thousand, yeah. Get the whole congregation out. That's but, amazing. Uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, that lasted three years. And I, yeah, but then, you know, I tried going into uh, some uh, smaller colleges and high schools, and they didn't want professional wrestling because of all the shit uh, that uh, Vince was pulling. Mm. And... Uh, I said, hey, my wrestling organization is based right along the side of uh, AWA, you know, Vern Gagne's, and everybody right. remembers, you know, they remember me wrestling. Exactly. So I said, that's, you know, our, ours is up, up, um, you know, we, we don't uh, degrade anybody or any organizations. We're not racist and we're not, uh, you know, this and that, you know, like uh, WWF or WWE by then, I guess. Right, right. And, uh, boy, boy, I'll tell you, the power of TV, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't talk them into believing me. So they believed that wrestling was just like that dirty, filthy WWE. <laughs> there you go. Well, they kind of did a turnaround, and and their product now, while I'm quite frankly boring, they they're not very you know vulgar anymore. What is your thoughts on on modern wrestling the way it is now, and and the way wrestling looks these days versus the glory days? I wish I could give you an answer. I don't watch that shit anymore. <laughs> when was the last time you did watch? I, a friend of mine came over and we caught a little bit of uh, WrestleMania. Ah, okay. Uh, I think it was, that was two days, wasn't it? Saturday yeah. and Sunday? Yeah, they do it two days yeah, now, yeah. We caught a little bit of uh, Sunday. I didn't even know it was on Saturday. There you go. I think we watched two or three matches and that was it. I had other stuff to do. All right. But yeah, I, I, I couldn't really tell you. No problem. Is it any good? Well, th when they get to the matches, it is, but they have three hours, and, you know, if you watch a three-hour show, you might get 20 minutes of wrestling and two hours and yeah. 40 minutes of commercials and talking. So it's kind of... <laughs> it, yeah. It, you got to fight to see the wrestling. That's You got to fight through the yeah. other stuff. Well, that's what I figured. That, that, I didn't have time to see all the nonsense and everything, you know, but... I guess it was uh, successful, right? Oh, yeah. It was a huge crowd and huge yeah. numbers. So, yeah, absolutely. They, they're doing something right, if, even if I don't really... <laughs> if I don't yeah. enjoy it, it doesn't matter. They're doing something right. It's, somebody must be enjoying it. Yeah. Well, it, it's not like wrestling was 20, 30, 40 years ago. 
uh, 50 years ago. I almost Even. started 50 years ago. <laughs> almost? But, uh, yeah, it's, you know, everything changes. Look at professional football. That's all different. My my brothers played back in the 50s. I mean, and uh, for Baltimore Colts and Dallas Cowboys and Dallas Seahawks. Uh, well, my oldest brother was head, the first head coach ever for the Seattle Seahawks. Oh, wow. Yeah, Jack I, Patera. I did not know there was a relation. Wow, that's amazing. Well, now you know. Now I know. And for those who want to know more, um, again, your book, KenPatera.com, you can get it. It's called The Weight of the World. And uh, I guess for... I, I I heard you say on, on a, a couple more questions that I promise you I'll let you off the phone. I heard you say, you know, you, you take these Hall of Fames very prestigious, the St. Louis Wrestling Hall of Fame and the WWE Hall of Fame. Um, what does it mean to you? When, you know, hey, hold on. Uh-huh. I never said I was in the WWE Hall of Fame. Are you not? No. Oh, shit. I apologize. I just assumed you were in there. No. <laughs> well, I guess this this well, obvious question. Assumptions would... are like assholes. Everybody has one. There you go. Well, I just assumed with a guy like yourself, you'd be in there. Do you want to be? I... After all these years, fuck no. <laughs> <laughs> Why bother? I mean, uh, it's not going to change my life. There you know, you everybody come. knows who I am. And everybody knows what I've done. Vince uh, McMahon put that Hall of Fame together. It doesn't even have a building. But, you know, maybe he'll build a building someday. But uh, there's uh, no... Uh, uh, bricks or mortar uh, uh, that contains all the stuff that WWF uh, Hall of Fame uh, consists of, and uh, I mean it's just it's for him to look what I created, look what I did. Mm. <laughs> so, no, it, it doesn't matter. I'm mm. in the. Uh, Hall of Fame for weightlifting. That's I'm right. St. Louis. As a matter of fact, I'm going to St. Louis on Friday. All right. Uh, for their uh, big gala. And uh, uh, that Hall of Fame means more than the WWF Hall of Fame uh, because it's part of the NWA that yep. started in the 30s and it went right through. Uh, uh, Let's see. Well, they inducted me eight, nine years ago. Yeah, they're still around. The uh... Yeah, and there's, there's not even 100 guys in that Hall of Fame. You know, so. Awesome. But well, anyway. Anyway, last last chance to, to talk about the book, and then I promise I'll let you off the phone. Um, what do you hope that people that are considering buying this book and read it, what do you hope they take away from the actual Ken Patera story, The Weight of the World. Well, but I'm like everybody else. I had a childhood. I had, uh, you know, grade school, high school, college. I, I have a college degree, believe it or not. I believe I have it. <laughs> I have two. I have a four-year degree from Brigham Young University. Very, very prestigious university. Absolutely. Provo, Utah, and sure. uh, I have a good football team year. too. Huh? They have a pretty good football team too. Well, they have an unbelievable sports uh, complex out there. Oh, mm -hmm. Fantastic! Yeah, yeah. It, it looks like a campus that could hold the Olympic Games. As a I matter will. of fact, we do have a campus that could hold the Olympic Games. It's that big and that impressive, and uh, they have everything out there. Yeah. So, uh, and for those that don't know Brigham Young University, it's owned by the Mormon Church. Yep. Yeah. And uh, more, 
the Mormons are really good people. They really are. And uh, I'm not a Mormon. You know, they they try to get me to convert. But uh, <laughs> I got called into the dean's office one day, my senior year at Brigham Young. And uh-huh. There are rumors that Ken Patera is out browsing around drinking and smoking with some friends of his. Mm-hmm. I think from Arizona State. Very, <laughs> well, that's where I went, so it's it's possible. That's that's entirely possible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so anyway, he calls me and he tells me that I've been reported six times in the past two years, and I you only get three strikes there. You know, if you're turned in three times, you know, for uh, bad behavior, which alcohol, yeah. smoking, be right at the top. Uh, but he let me uh, slide, and because I was on the track and field team, mm-hmm. and I just won the national weightlifting championships for colleges about a month before that. And then I was uh, forcing the world in the shot put. And I was a good discus thrower, a good hammer thrower. So uh, uh, Robbie Robinson was, uh, or not Robinson, Robson. He was the head track and field coach there. and He was on the dean's cabinet. So he went to bat for me and got all that, you know, uh, leveled out, you know, where it actually made sense. So I didn't get kicked out of school. Because if I would have got kicked out the track and field team, I would have got kicked out of school. And was... so I stayed in school and graduated. Beautiful. And you said that you had two degrees. That was BYU. And what was the other one? Now, the other one, you're going to get a giggle out of this. MIT. Really? Yeah. I'll tell you what MIT stands for. Multnoma right. in town. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it was Multnoma Mal- Mal- Junior College. There you go. Uh, yeah, I got a two-year degree from there. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and then that was in between... Uh, that was in between... Uh, uh, Portland State, yeah, Portland State University and uh, University of Oregon and Brigham Young. Yeah. So, <laughs> that's Oklahoma all. in town. That's perfect. <laughs> My, but, MIT. <laughs> MIT. Well, it sounds better to say MIT, I think. That sounds impressive. Yeah, um, I, I, I knew I'd get you on that one. You did. You got me. I appreciate you taking the time to do this. Again, KenPatera.com is where you can get the book. You can get it on Amazon.com and WOHW.com as well. But if you want it personalized, if you want to get it from the man himself, KenPatera.com. And uh, before I let you go, do you mind if I ask for a favor from you? Sure. Go ahead. Uh, You probably know what I'm going to ask, but do you mind if I get like a station ID just saying this is Ken Patera and you're listening to the Wrestling Epicenter? Yeah. All right. Should I do the whole countdown for you? No, I'll do it right now. Yeah. All right. Let's go. This is Ken Patera, world's strongest wrestler, and you are listening to the epicenter of professional wrestling. This is Interactive Wrestling Radio. 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 Oh, what a rush. Featuring the interactive interview. 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 Oh, yeah. Formerly the Blaze. The blade, 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 the
on WrestlingEpicenter.com. Wrestling Epicenter. Wrestling Epicenter. Wrestling Epicenter. Wrestling Epicenter. The Wrestling Epicenter. Don't get off. And now we shamelessly name drop from our history. The Wrestling Epicenter would like to apologize for the following. All right, everybody. Arriba la raza. Arriba la raza. Hey, y'all. Hello, ladies. Hey, guys. We had a lovely conversation. First lady, absolutely. Oh, look at me. She's so kooky. Hi. <laughs> Be there. Where else? Interactive Wrestling Radio. Wrestling Epicenter. Oh, my God. In the land of extreme. <laughs> Don't forget to like and subscribe.